We're breaking in to take you to the state capitol where Governor Jared Polis is about to give another address regarding the state's reaction to COVID-19. Let's go there live and listen in. Seem like years in our lives. Uh, in the scheme of things, it is two months. And the most important thing is we take the right actions, the responsible actions, so that we are all here for many months and many years to come. Uh, we act boldly to save lives and to make sure that you're empowered with the information you need to make the right choices to keep yourself and your fa family safe. I also want to point out that while the first confirmed case was two months ago yesterday, I think it was somebody interviewed me about this so-called patient zero, it is now uh, found to be extremely likely that the virus was circulating in Colorado unbeknownst to us uh, before that first case was diagnosed. And uh, there's increasing evidence that in fact there had been greater spread across the world, uh, but it had manifested mostly as pneumonia symptoms in hospital wards and the numbers weren't such that uh, the world was on alert yet. So we don't know whether that first case in Colorado was in January or in February, um, but it's very likely that the first diagnosed case and confirmed case in Colorado was not in fact the first case in Colorado and that's the same for uh, states across the country. Two months, two months, uh, two of the first months of the coronavirus crisis which will be with us for many months to come and really necessitates us all making the right choices in our lives to only go out when you need to uh, and to wear a mask when you're in public and to try to be six feet away, at least six feet away, hopefully eight or 10 feet away from others uh, whenever you can to reduce those interactions. 60 to 70% of, of the interactions you have, uh, you should have only about a third of the interactions you had in January or February and what that does, if we succeed, if you have a third of the interactions, if I have a third of the interactions, uh, I have a lot less, honestly, because in the line of work I'm in, I used to have hundreds of personal interactions a day. What do we say, you know, hugging babies and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and saying hi to large groups. So don't do that anymore. Uh, I have these press briefings. Uh, folks are at a safe distance, I wear a mask. Uh, I work a lot from, from home on, on uh, Zoom and Skype and all of those services. And I know many of you are too. Uh, if we're all successful in cutting down our personal contacts to about a third of what they were before this crisis, uh, the modeling and the math shows that we're, we're going to get through this. Now, getting through this doesn't mean that nobody's going to get coronavirus in June or in July. Uh, people will across the country, across the world, and some will be hospitalized and some won't make it but at least we can make sure that we don't exceed our hospital capacity and that everybody who gets it has a fighting chance of, of getting through this, and of course, most will. You know, at the beginning of this crisis, uh, modeling was showing tens of thousands of deaths in, in Colorado and a catastrophic breach, uh, breach of our healthcare system by now. But thanks to the actions that you took and the success you had staying at home, we averted that. It's not a time to celebrate. We've lost over 850 Coloradans to this crisis. But thanks to your hard work, your staying at home, your wearing masks, the sacrifices you've made, the social distancing, and resisting the temptation to break the rules, we are bending the curve. We have saved lives in Colorado. We will save lives in Colorado. If we slack off, you know, uh, it means more unnecessary deaths of our friends and our loved ones, might even be yours, and more economic disruption. The better the job that we do, maintaining distance, cutting our interactions to a third of what they used to be, the more that we'll get through this with the most possible number of lives intact and with shorter disruptions to our economy and to business. And many of that, much of that of the workforce is, is returning to something closer to sustainable every day. It's kind of like uh, a diet, right? You can't eat right and exercise for two months, which we did, and then just go back to your old habits. You can't expect to keep the weight off if you do that. It's got to be sustainable for the long term if you want to maintain progress. And, uh, you know, athletes, professional, amateur, don't just go to practice for a couple months and then they're, they're at their highest level for the year. They have to keep working on it. You know, I'm, I love to play baseball. And when I was playing baseball, I knew I couldn't just go to batting practice a few times and then call it a day and, and get through the whole season. You work day in and day out to see those rewards uh, because if we let up, we're all going to strike out. And it's really important that we maintain our dedication to the common sense, the common sense 
six feet away from others, reducing our social interactions, wearing masks when you're in public, simple common sense things that are in your hands uh, to see how this, uh, our success in Colorado. The good news is Coloradans are continuing to make responsible choices to keep themselves and others safe. And I wanna thank you because only you can do that. Your city, your county, your state, your federal government can't do that, only you can do that. So thank you for making the right choices. We have uh, 17,816 positive cases in our state. That's confirmed. We all know it several times that. Uh, and tragically, 921 deaths is the latest update. Uh, each of those is a tragedy. And uh, I want to express my sincere condolences to the families that are in mourning across our state as we keep the families of the 921 Coloradans we've lost to coronavirus in our thoughts. As of yesterday, the growth rate of cases uh, is about 2%. As we do more and more testing, we're reporting a higher and higher percentage of the total cases. What's important for folks to know is that the virus is still out there. It will be out there. It's in our communities. And we need to be smart and safe, staying six feet apart where we can and wearing masks in public. And of course, we're gonna see daily fluctuations based on when numbers come out, but the trend as a whole continues to be steady and encouraging. Same thing with hospitalizations. Yesterday, 0.3% growth rate in hospitalizations. Still low, but that still means, especially you know, compared to where we were six to eight weeks ago, but that still means Coloradans are still being rushed to ICUs and hospitals because of coronavirus, and we need to make sure that we have the ability to serve them, as well as the non-coronavirus patients, the patients that have heart attacks and strokes and appendicitis. There needs to be capacity for both of that in our life-saving system. And while we're encouraged by these trend lines, we didn't get there by accident. We got there because you stayed at home successfully and are now acting safer at home and taking the appropriate measures to continue this progress. We want to prevent our healthcare system from being overloaded. We want to make sure every Coloradan gets the high quality care they need when they need it. And we all know that on National Nurses Day, which is today, I want the public and the media to really have the opportunity to hear straight from one of our brave frontline heroes. And you know, our doctors, our nurses, our technicians, the maintenance staff and support are really working to save lives every day. You know, 921 deaths uh, would be thousands of deaths in Colorado, if not for all of the folks, including the nurses and doctors, really rising to the occasion to save so many lives with oxygen and in some cases with ventilators. I'm honored today on National Nurses Day to introduce Laura Rosenthal, who has been a registered nurse for over 20 years. She's uh, been worked in Colorado as a nurse practitioner in hospital medicine for 14 years. She's a registered nurse health services volunteer for the American Red Cross Rocky Mountain chapter. And in addition to her clinical duties, she's also an assistant dean of the Doctor of Nursing Practice program at University of Colorado uh, College of Nursing. It's my honor on National Nurses Day to really highlight the critical role that nurses are playing across our state, across our country, and uh, who better to do that than a nurse from the front lines in Colorado sharing her stories, Laura Rosenthal. Thank you, Governor Polis. My name is Laura Rosenthal. I'm the vice president of the Colorado Nurses Association and a nurse practitioner taking care of hospitalized patients with COVID-19. I'm here today to share with you the reality of what myself and thousands of other healthcare practitioners are experiencing here in Colorado, not in New York, not in China, but here in our own backyard. I am also here today on National Nurses Day to ask you, actually plead, that you stay home as much as possible and follow Colorado's safer at home implementation. COVID-19 is unlike anything that I've seen in my 20 years as of an experienced nurse. It is not an old people disease, nor a sick people disease. And although these populations are more susceptible to COVID-19, it affects all people. In the past six weeks, I have treated patients as young as 25 and as old as 99. I treated a previously healthy 32-year-old male in the intensive care unit struggling to breathe. Pregnant women, fathers of young children, and entire families, all hospitalized and ill. A husband who had never spent a night away from his wife and was now battling life and death on his own in the ICU because when you are admitted to a hospital with COVID, 
you can't bring anybody with you. I will never forget talking to his wife on the phone and enduring the difficulty of when she said, I know you can't promise me that he will come home. It is hard to fathom the consequences of the virus until you have seen it in someone acutely ill. I know it is easy to believe that COVID will not affect you, but it already has. It has affected all of us in Colorado. And although you may hear Governor Polis talk about declining numbers, we need to remember its effect. We have seen a decrease in cases, which is the result of a successful stay-at-home order. It is because people observed the rules regarding social distancing and did their part by wearing facial coverings. As a result, this has allowed the state of Colorado to slowly open its doors in an attempt to return to what was once normal. But because things seem to be going in the right direction, we must not forget the intense fear that we've experienced over the past six weeks. As the weather warms and we transition to the safer at home phase, now is the most crucial time for continued diligence. There is a natural need to socialize and work. And I, like many others, feel the stress of remaining at home. It is difficult mentally and physically, and it is frustrating on a daily basis. We want to be out there enjoying all the amazing things Colorado has to offer. But please take caution and do it slowly and with great precaution. Remember that 30 to 50% of people may continue to shed virus and not have any symptoms. Many are positive and do not have cough or fever. There is still the potential for rapid increase in disease spread if we are not alert to our surroundings. I ask for your continued commitment to staying at home as much as possible and follow safer at home phases through by using face coverings out in public, continued physical distancing, and not gathering in public. There will eventually be a time when we can do this again, but we are not quite ready now. Nurses are out there fighting to protect you, and please do your part. During 2020, the year of the nurse, and especially today on Nurses' Day, your support of the nursing profession does not go unnoticed. Thank you. And, and Laura, you know, the, the howls every night at 8 p.m. that many Coloradans here in their neighborhood, the flyovers, I think there was one today, there was one the other day. Uh, this is all to show our appreciation for the work that you do, that your fellow nurses do, that our medical professionals do. And on behalf of a grateful state of Colorado, I just want to say thank you uh, to so many of our frontline workers. And, you know, Laura didn't say this, but uh, some of the highest infection rates are among our nurses and frontline workers. Um, uh, there's, and, and they take every precaution that they can, but despite that, uh, they're putting themselves at risk every day. They're not just working long hours. Uh, they're not just uh, engaged in, a, in, in very stressful uh, life and death battles, but they really are putting themselves at risk. Many nurses and medical professionals have themselves contracted coronavirus. Uh, and, and, you know, you entered that profession knowing that infection was a risk, and you didn't know, we didn't know about coronavirus at the time, but uh, nurses are always at risk of other bacterial and viral infections, uh, and this one, of course, is particularly dangerous. So on Nurses Day and every day, uh, I want to thank uh, everybody in Colorado who is doing their best to help with, uh, with this crisis. Thank you, Laura, and thank you, nurses. I just want to give an update on where we are with uh, the state uh, purchases of personal protective equipment, which really ties into protecting our medical professionals, because much of it goes right out to our medical professionals. Some of it also goes to those who work in our senior care and nursing home facilities. Uh, my last update was April 1st on what we've acquired, so we've made success, uh, a lot of progress this then, since then. Uh, I want to thank uh, Pat Myers, who had been uh, Chief of Staff to Governor Hickenlooper. He has uh, joined our emergency operations effort and our innovation group to help us with personal protection equipment acquisition uh, these last couple of weeks and, and was willing to drop what he was doing and, and join right in and I want to thank him and the team. Since my last update we've acquired, uh, which means arrived in Colorado and, and, and generally deployed, um, almost 2.5 million surgical masks, 116,000 face shields, those are the plastic face shields, 195,000 gowns, 1.6 million gloves, 534,000 N95 masks. And 
Just to show the difference, again, this is neither a surgical mask nor an N95 mask. This is a civilian mask. It might be similar to the one you wear. It's similar to a scarf or an old T-shirt. This one was made for me, coloradomaskproject.com. Uh, this one was actually made by Function Wear, uh, a number of Colorado uh, outdoor industry apparel manufacturers have converted to making masks. But the N95 masks are the medical grade masks. That's what we want to make sure Laura has. Uh, she's not wearing one now because she shouldn't be. But when she's in her ward uh, that protect against the virus, the surgical masks offer uh, a lot of protection as well. Those are the flat masks, right? So think surgical is flat. Uh, N95 uh, have a shape to them, and they have a little, uh, uh, a little, little device on the end that ensures that air gets in and virus doesn't. So we're acquiring all of those. There's a lot of purchase orders uh, pending. Also requests from the federal government in their hopper, and we're casting a very wide net because we know all the results won't go through. I mean, the stories that, that we have of, of purchases that, that didn't happen, um, the, some are outright scams, some are inferior equipment, some need to be tested and verified, people trying to sell things that they don't have. Uh, but we have been successful in navigating these waters as a state thanks to the work of the Innovation Group, the Emergency Operations Center, our very flexible team uh, of folks that we've brought in from the private and public sectors to navigate these very challenging waters on the international supply chain. And I'm really uh, thrilled that we're able to, especially on Nurses Day, announce this degree of success around supplies, a lot of which wind up uh, with nurses. We also know that our senior care facilities are particularly vulnerable, so we're taking extra steps to get additional mass and protection equipment out to our nursing homes. This is already deployed. Uh, we've deployed over 85,000 masks, uh, generally uh, surgical, uh, some other types, 7,400 eye protection, generally goggles, 77,000 gowns, 388,000 gloves, and we're really stepping up that effort. And we're working with Colorado National Guard and also with Colorado State University to do specialized targeted testing of workers at senior facilities, workers with no symptoms, because up to half of the people who have coronavirus don't have symptoms, especially in the younger population. Uh, we want to stop it from being brought into these facilities to the extent we can. Uh, and when we identify asymptomatic or symptomatic members of the community, we want to isolate them, do the contact tracing, and grab control of the virus sooner rather than later uh, to save lives among a group that is more vulnerable than any other group. As Laura mentioned, everybody's potentially vulnerable. As, as you know, we lost a 21-year-old um, Ridgeview High School graduate who was a ball player at Mesa. Uh, and while many people in their 20s and 30s and 40s will get through it just fine, uh, it absolutely can be fatal to people of any age and sometimes is, but it has a far worse trajectory for people in their 70s and 80s uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a much higher, much higher hospitalization rate and a much higher fatality rate. And because of the age of the population in our nursing homes, our senior facilities, uh, likelihood of uh, many underlying health conditions at that age, as well as the close proximity of the residents living in a residential setting like a dormitory, we're doing everything that we can to continue to step up the efforts to keep these facilities safer. I also want to show you where the PPE is going after the state obtains it. Um, this is kind of the first time we're talking about where the state sends it. So about 40% has gone to first responders, 23% to hospitals, 11.5% to senior care facilities, 6.1% to home care. That means that seniors who have in-home services, we want the folks that are providing those to have masks. 4.3% to emergency management and public health, 4% to clinics. 3.7% to hospital designees, that means folks that are designated by hospitals that might not work on the hospital premises, uh, and then smaller amounts going to other folks, including uh, emergency operation people. Uh, we're still working as hard as we can to obtain additional masks, gloves, and gowns for Colorado. Thankfully, uh, we've also been the recipient of some amazing innovation and technology that also has helped us ease the pressure on our mask needs. Uh, we've received not one, but two Battelle sterilization systems from FEMA to de decontaminate thousands of N95 respirator masks each day using concentrated vapor phase hydrogen peroxide. Uh, extremely effective at ensuring that the virus is eliminated and that those masks can be used again if necessary. The Battelle sterilization system at the Adams County Fairgrounds in Brighton is already operational. It's sterilizing uh, N95 masks every day for over 100 skilled nursing centers, hospitals,
hospitals and other healthcare providers. And we got our second system in. It'll begin operating in Montrose next week. So in addition to the new PPE, and here's what this looks like, uh, we are now able to safely redeploy high quality N95 masks to prevent additional infection. You can think of it as a massive sterilization and dishwasher for these critical life-saving and increasingly scarce N95 masks that we need more of, uh, and this is such important work. I also uh, want to announce that the state has received $7.9 million from Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS. That's for our e-health innovation. That'll help Colorado develop even more telehealth, telemedicine possibilities for Coloradans to help make sure that we can get more of our medical care needs met without having to leave our homes. Uh, and doctors' offices are, of course, safe. Uh, they're very sterile, but we still want to limit in-person interactions as much as we can to prevent the spread of coronavirus, and um, particularly for our most vulnerable. And we want to make sure that we extent we can do that. We want to keep medical professionals like Laura and our other nurses and doctors as safe as possible on the front lines. And it's very, especially important when we're diagnosing coronavirus cases. Many uh, diagnoses and initial consultations can simply be carried out over telehealth chat video uh, rather than a physical invitation. Uh, you can use these telehealth options. Just visit covid19.colorado.gov. Scroll down the page and find the telehealth section, covid19.colorado.gov. Uh, and you're welcome to do that. I know uh, we also wanted to share some additional news today. Uh, technology like Patel and telehealth are useful tools, but there's really no substitute for people doing the right thing. Wearing masks, you can find out more about how to make one or patterns or if you need one or if you have a special time at coloradomaskproject.com. The more people do the right thing, the sooner that we can relax more restrictions and fewer people will die. And this isn't a competition to see if you can get away with cheating. It's a competition to see how quickly we can get through this together by using common sense and following the spirit of our science-based guidance. The vast, vast majority of people understand this completely, and I am so grateful that you are taking this seriously. The numbers wouldn't be where they are today if there wasn't widespread buy-in from you, and I'm glad that you are being smart. So please, let's keep up the good work. Let's keep managing the crisis responsibly for the sake of ourselves, our medical professionals, including our nurses like Laura, and our great state. Uh, I have a couple online questions I'll get to before I get to the questions from the press. Uh, Shelley asks, masks are nasty and are just allowing you to inhale bacteria. Uh, your mask should not be nasty, Shelley. Um, you wash it after a day's use. Uh, if a mask wasn't washed for a number of days, it could be host to bacteria. Our old friends, strep and staff are still out there, but we are using these to avoid large uh, droplets and infection from a virus. Uh, viruses uh, are not alive in a technical sense, the way a bacterial infection is. Uh, that's one of the reasons that food is a lower risk for the uh, takeout and delivery services. The contact with the person is the higher risk. If it was a bacterial infection, the, the food would be the higher risk because it would live on the food. So your mask should not be nasty. You should wash your mask once a day uh, if you want to. You might even go through two masks in a day. Uh, but if you're using the same mask day after day after day after day, it might still work to uh, help lower the risk of the virus and prevent you from touching your mouth and nose, but that's true if you weren't cleaning it after a period of time, it could in fact have staph or strep. Again, those are our old friends. It's not that they're not a problem, they are, but that's not what we're, we have something called antibiotics that work against staph and strep. So it's not our primary concern right now, but you shouldn't be wearing old masks day after day after day. Just launder it every day. The laundry, a uh, hot cycle, complete sterilization works just fine, and, uh, and it will absolutely reduce the infection risk in several ways. Um, Alex asked, I didn't escape a brutal regime that made us slaves of fear just to come to this beautiful home of the brave just to be a slave of fear again. And to Alex, I want to say, don't be a slave of fear. This is not a time for fear. It's not a time for anxiety. It's time for informed caution. Be smart, use your caution, you're free, no one's stopping you from taking walks, going to the store, going to work, you can do all that, but 
exercise your own personal responsibility. That's really the flip side of the coin of freedom. We also have individual responsibility to ourselves and to others. They're both uh, very important as well. Um, with that, I would love to open it up to questions from the media, and I want to thank uh, my fellow residents of Colorado for being smart and using common sense to get us through this. Yes. And you can continue to watch the governor's press conference. That'll be made available over on 9news.com. We're going to head back to programming in just a minute, though. But uh, today, National Nurses Day. So the governor with a special guest, uh, the vice president of the Colorado Nurses Association, Laura Rosenthal, who's been on those front lines for more than 20 years now. And uh, she was basically just making a plea to people to please stay home. She said she has treated people from the ages of 25 on up to 99, has seen the worst of it and would like as much help as possible from, from all of us. So please stay home, her plea. Uh, the governor also uh, bringing some partial uh, updated numbers as far as uh, 450 more cases of COVID-19 in the state up over 17,800 and an additional 18 deaths to report 921 now officially in Colorado at this point. Again, we are going to get an update in about two hours from Colorado's Department of Public Health and Environment. Also in about two hours, four o'clock at nine news, we'll have much more on what the governor had to say. We'll also talk about National Nurses Day as well. So we hope to see you then. Takeout line is really uh, offensive to anybody who supports the freedom and liberty that we enjoy in this country. Um, we need to do our best to honor those who are working in a retail environment. They're putting themselves at additional risk. And yes, the least the customers can do is, is stand six feet apart when they're waiting to check out uh, and avoid congregating together. It's common sense. Uh, it's uh, with it's exercising our individual responsibility. Uh, in a way that is smart uh, and that shows common sense that nearly all Coloradans have. And for the few Coloradans who feel that their liberties are being threatened, I ask them to also exercise their own personal responsibility to protect themselves, their families, and others. Whether you agree or disagree with counties that want you to wear masks in stores and have required that, it's important as a matter of responsibility. Whether you live in an area that requires it or not, to wear a mask when you are around others to protect themselves and yourself. Hello, uh, Governor. This is Vinnie Del Judice at the uh, Bloomberg News in Denver. Thank you for these briefings. Uh, two questions the Western Governors Coalition and Nursing Homes. First, with the coalition, can you give us an update? And are the governors of the Western states working together to ensure adequate supplies of PPE? Uh, personnel, ventilators, what have you. Now, on the nursing homes, half of the deaths in the state, or roughly a half, have been in nursing homes. Are, were these unavoidable tragedies, or were there actually shortcomings in the healthcare system, the geriatric system, uh, that could have been prevented and are going to be reviewed? Thank you very much, sir. Uh, we are working closely with other Western states, uh, both formally, semi-formally, through a group of Western states. I also am in regular contact with our neighboring state governors. Uh, we have strong working relationships. We know that people move back and forth between Colorado and Northern Colorado and Wyoming, Southern Colorado and New Mexico, Eastern Colorado and Nebraska, uh, and Kansas, Western Colorado and Utah. We know that happens every day. And so there has been a strong approach. We've also have a strong information sharing platform with other Western states including Nevada, Oregon, Washington, California, that's been very helpful to my chief of staff and has helped inform our decision making by elevating that to a higher level. There is not any formal equipment sharing arrangement between those states, but there have been instances already of, of, of states that have been willing to, when they have excess capacity, help others uh, when they need it to put in that request. I was on a National Governors Association call today, and we talked a lot about how all 50 states and the territories can better cooperate to meet this goal. With regard to our senior uh, home facilities and our veteran care facilities, uh, if the federal government had made more testing available earlier, we could have begun testing asymptomatic workers at those facilities earlier and potentially prevented some of those infections. That's one of our top priorities for testing now. Uh, is testing asymptomatic workers at the facilities. There's still not enough testing to do it 
the needed, you know, uh, once a week for every employee at a senior care facility. We're not there. Uh, we've been through the first round, starting with some of the larger facilities, but it's only as good as a moment in time, meaning you have to go back to some of those very same facilities a week or two later to test some of those same workers to see if they might be contagious and asymptomatic. Um, so that's one of the most important things that we can do and are doing. We also implemented some of the very first protections for our senior care facilities. So before uh, there was uh, stay at home or safer at home or any of that, we limited visitation to our senior care facilities and required masks and temperature checks for workers across our state. There's no question that that has saved lives in Colorado uh, and we would have far more than the over 900 deaths that we have today had those measures not been the very first ones that went in. In person? Um, two questions about frontline workers. Uh, as you mentioned, it's, it's Nurses Day. Knowing that various medical professionals are facing cuts to hours and wages, is there anything you can do to intervene with them, first of all? Well, you know, there's what, what during, part of the, during part of the first month, there were a number of hospitals that were not doing um, non-emergency procedures. And so there were medical personnel associated with that non-emergency piece. Some of them were not able to work. The, their customers weren't there. We needed the beds and the personal protection equipment for COVID-19. Now, those non-emergency procedures, some call them elective procedures, but the problem with calling them that is people think elective procedures means a cosmetic procedure, and if you, if you want one, you can get one, but it's not about that. It's really about procedures that can be put off. It could be a knee replacement. It could be something related even to a cancer that you can delay for a period of weeks or months but still need to do. So these are very important non-emergency medical procedures. Uh, they are now able to be done in Colorado since April 27th. They are being done, and that will address a lot of the uh, folks that were um, were working with those that in the month of April had less work. Symptomatic cases with a plant, a place like the JBS plant reopening uh, without testing. How can those workers be confident that they're not being exposed, given the previous outbreak there and the amount of asymptomatic cases? So we have provided free, we being the state of Colorado, uh, provided free testing just a mile from the plant at a at a park in Greeley. Uh, well over a thousand people got tested there. It was available not just for JBS employees, but for, you know, they have uh, family members and others that were in the community. Uh, JBS has also worked closely with Weld County Health to make sure that they have the right social distancing and mask wearing protocols at work to help keep their other workers safe from some that might not have gone for testing but might still be asymptomatic but could potentially be contagious. Telephone? Uh, well, we make the testing available. Um, we continue to encourage JPS to test every employee. Uh, absent them doing that, we, uh, would, we've made the testing available for free to residents in a very convenient way, just a mile from the plant. Telephone? Governor Charles Ashby from the Grand Junction Daily Sentinel. Uh, last week I asked you a question about whether or not you would be supportive of bills that uh, are designed to help businesses, uh, tax credit type programs. This week, I'm hearing that there are certain state agencies, such as OEDIT, that want lawmakers to back away from those kind of bills. Uh, given uh, the high support there's been for the uh, loan money for small businesses and stimulus checks, uh, where are you on that? Do you think that those kind of programs should go forward? You kind of indicated that last week. Well, let me, uh, let me, I'll give you a follow-up, Charles, because I'm, I'm not quite sure if I understand the context of your question. I'm very supportive of the Paycheck Protection Program, now in its second tranche. Uh, so many Colorado businesses, in fact, uh, in the first round, 11% more uh, relative to our population got funded through PPP to be able to keep their employees on payroll and uh, for the, the two-month period. Um, at the state level, I'm, I'm not sure which programs are they current bills you're asking me about. This is what I'd, I'm not sure, Charles. What, what particular state programs are you talking about? Uh, specifically, the uh, Rural Jumpstart Bill that uh, was already out of the House and now in the Senate. Um, it calls for $45,000 for additional staffer at OEDIT. Um, it doesn't, doesn't uh, cost any revenue because these are for businesses that don't yet exist, so there's no loss there, but there are tax credits to them. Yeah. Um, the speaker said that she liked that bill and thought it should go through, and now I'm hearing how at it wants uh, Senator Donovan to drop the bill. No, uh, overall, 
it should be no shock that there is belt tightening across the entire economy. Uh, families who've lost an income or partial income or cutting their budgets, of course the state uh, has belt tightening and that's completely appropriate during this difficult economic period. Uh, $45,000 uh, is a very small amount relative to the overall budget items being considered. And if it's a priority that helps get the economy going in rural Colorado, we can still work with the speaker and the legislature to find room for that in the budget, despite overall cuts to agencies, including OEDIT. Yeah, if, if, uh, to be clear, if JBS is willing to test all employees, we would be happy to work with them on making sure they have the supplies to do that. Um, we, we can't just go on their premises and test people. That's why we did it a mile away. Uh, and we plan on continuing to making testing available uh, when we can in the area. And Weld County Health, uh, it's a priority for them as well. Uh, but we would certainly work with JBS uh, on testing all employees, which was part of their original plan. And then unfortunately they did back away from that and chose to be closed for 14 days instead, which uh, did, did give some time. Uh, but we want to continue to work both with them or if needed around them to increase the availability of testing to community members in Greeley, as well as workers of the JBS plant, but both because uh, these are folks who live and work in Greeley and we're just as worried about their neighbors, their friends, uh, store owners who serve them and, and many others in addition to those who work directly at the JBS plant. Hi, Governor Mary Ann Goodland with Colorado Politics. Uh, during the 2009 recession, Governor Bill Ritter ordered state employees to take four unpaid furlough days um, through the last four months of that year. Are you considering anything similar? Are you looking at furloughs for state employees? Well, with regard to budget questions and, and the one that Charles asked with such a you know, smaller dollar amount, $45,000, I was able to give a more optimistic figure. But with the larger things, uh, I just have to defer and say we're waiting on the estimates, the May 12th estimates. We're not too far from those. Once we get those, uh, we will, of course, uh, work to ensure that there's a balanced budget. Uh, there's going to be belt tightening, appropriately so, in the public sector, just as there is on people's families' budgets. And we look forward to doing that in the best way that we can to make sure that the critical services that are provided for uh, the taxpayers of the state can continue. Governor, you said that it's in a recession, it's not the right time to raise taxes for the two probably Well, there are many, many dozens of, of ballot initiatives, Alex, and uh, it's always been my practice um, not to uh, talk about individual ones uh, until we actually know what's on the ballot. I've never been shy to share my opinion about ballot initiatives, if I have one. There's some that I might support, some that I might oppose, some that I might be neutral on. But uh, there are dozens and dozens of different proposals. I'm not intricately familiar with the one that, uh, or the ones, perhaps, that you're referring to. Uh, but there are, uh, I, and I don't know whether they're going to be on the ballot or not. Well, my focus has been uh, reducing the state income tax uh, from 4.63% this year. We reduced it to 4.5% on a one-year basis. I would love to work with Democrats and Republicans in the legislature to find a way to keep it at 4.5% or reduce it further on a revenue neutral basis, meaning without sacrificing any revenue by eliminating tax expenditures. Uh, no one has, as far as I know, talked about that, but I would be open to uh, groups that were working that at the ballot box as well. But it has been our preference to work with uh, bipartisan leaders in the legislature. Uh, but that, 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 you know, this year it has already gone down to 4.5%. Yeah, this is Erica Meltzer from Chalkbeat. Uh, 
There's been some reports uh, that El Paso County is seeking an exemption to have in-person, sort of more traditional in-person graduation ceremonies. They want an exemption to the guidelines that CDE issued, and we've heard some reports from some other locations as well. Is this something that you see a possibility for in the, in the near future? So uh, I, I talked uh, earlier this morning with our public health folks. As of this morning, we had not received that request. Uh, perhaps they're acting on that today. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, they want to proceed in a way that does not include parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles. They just want to have in, in a way that can uh, successfully implement social distancing the students back for a final ceremony. Uh, I think many of uh, many residents of El Paso County saw the successful exercises at the Air Force Academy where the students graduated with an empty stadium, but themselves were present. So I would just encourage uh, school districts to want to do that, to work with their county health department. But to be clear, nobody, this is not looking like what graduations or commencement look like um, in years past. I, I think districts have several options with commencement. Some are doing full out virtual commencement. Some are delaying uh, commencement indefinitely and offering to bring students back in July or August or when they can to appropriately celebrate the physical ceremony. Others might be trying to navigate a limited in-person ceremony without uh, guests and attendees that uh, honors the students in that way. Uh, I think what's important is that as a state, we celebrate this rite of passage for our graduating seniors. Uh, and I know that our seniors put in a lot of work to get that high school diploma, especially our first generation high school graduates. And uh, we want to honor that. We will work with our superintendents to do that in the best way. It might mean something that more resembles a traditional commencement that's a few months delayed. It might mean something virtual or more limited uh, in, in, uh, in, in the next month or so. Governor, uh, the task force on nursing homes, how is it doing so far? Have there been any compliance issues? Question number one. And number two, any new information on restaurants and bars and re relaxing those measures a bit past safer at home? So um, there were a, a number of uh, nursing home and senior care facilities that uh, received uh, negative citations and violations uh, through the Department of Health. I was very glad to see that because I had asked them several weeks ago to really step up enforcement, uh, even more so now. Uh, we want our nursing home partners to take this very seriously, deadly seriously. And of course, most of them are good actors and are doing their best and care deeply about their residents, but we want to find out if there are nursing home and senior centers that are trying to cut corners and make sure that they're penalized appropriately. Uh, there's no update on timing uh, for other uh, industries, and that's simply because, as I've indicated before, we want to see the data from the Safer at Home uh, over the next couple weeks to see where we're at uh, and, and, and with the individual decisions that Coloradans are making to succeed in social distancing and wearing masks when they go out. A final telephone question. Hello, Governor. I'm Jesus Carrasquel from Noticias Univision. Uh, in Spanish, Governor, Safer at Home sugiere a las personas a salir con mascarillas, pero es difícil conseguirlas en la tienda. ¿Cómo ayudará el Estado a conseguir estos elementos de protección para las personas y las empresas? Um, no es necesario comprar mascarillas. Uh, puede hacerlo con cosas en su casa, por ejemplo, camisas. La gente puede usar camisas viejas para taparse la boca. A cualquier cosa que cubre su nariz y su boca es suficiente como mascarilla. Uh, el Estado también uh, asociado con coloradomaskproject.com uh, para dar ayuda e información uh, como gente puede hacer uh, mascarillas. Gracias por su pregunta. Last question from the physical group. Uh, yes. Well, we want to help as many people as possible that are residents of our state that contribute to the prosperity and success of our state. Uh, that's why we set up the uh, nonprofit relief fund, HelpColoradoNow.org, uh, raised over $16 million. They just distributed their second round of funding. And we particularly are focused on helping folks that might have been left out of federal aid packages, including our refugee and immigrant communities. Uh, in a Colorado for All, uh, we know that both as a public health necessity as well as as an economic issue, uh, we want to make sure that we're able to help every resident of Colorado. 
Thank you. Thanks to all of the great nurses across the amazing state of Colorado. Thank you for staying safe, being safer at home, and wearing masks when you go out.